Happy Easter, everybody, and welcome Woo-hoo. to another Easter episode of Ignite Radio Live. You are with Greg and Stephanie Schleter over the five mighty stations of Annunciation Radio for the Almighty in the glory and power of his resurrection. And we're going to punctuate that tonight with a very special friend Mm. who I know is going to rock your world. I'm not going to put the pressure on him, but in the Holy Spirit. Capital R, capital O, capital C. He may rock your life. So so if you don't have a seatbelt, you may want to go out to your car and get one. Buckle (laughs) yourself up because the, the foundations of this earth, do they not need to be shaken? Do they not need to be shaken for us to discover who we are? And even more importantly, whose we are Mm. let that sink in you know until that happens we're going to be shaken one way or another and isn't it better that we be shaken into the truth of our true nature that is constantly under assault yours and mine this very moment we are fighting with lies and whispers that have been whispered to us our whole lives and we're laboring many of us even in this easter season of grace and i want to ask a couple questions here to set this up before we introduce my good friend my beloved friend blaine diachi um so question one is how many easters have you had in your life Life. You've had as many as how old you are, right? How many Lent and Easter's have you had? So profound seasons of grace, right? Now consider the question, how much closer to Christ are you having navigated through them? In my case, I'm age 53. So I've been through 53 cycles of Lent and Easter. What does that mean? Participating in the very life, death, and and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Are we cultivating cultures in our marriage, in our home of encounter? You know, year after year, are we growing closer? Can our kids say they more fully know Jesus Christ personally? Not just religion or connect the dots, but a Rembrandt, a flush experience or encounter of God alive. Does that even just like just sound religious to you right now? Is it just a bunch of religious holy words? Or is there meaning in that? The second thing I'm going to say, the enemy says to us, aspire to appear holy. And we've seen that foundation of trying to appear holy, we've seen it shattered. We've seen it broken, whether it be through the church, politics. We see these human systems and human things just collapse before our eyes. So that what? So that we're not tempted to try to appear holy and put our energy into trying to appear holy, but in actually becoming holy. And what's the heart of that? The heart of it is embracing the brokenness of the cross in our lives. I'll say it again. It's to embrace the brokenness of that we experience in the Holy Mass. This is my body broken for you. Literally, Christ's prayer to his Father. Are we entering into the brokenness of our lives, allowing him to enter in there so that we can be resurrected with Jesus? So the story you're gonna hear tonight, the true story, the chronicle of my brother's life, I think is gonna shake you. I think it's going to open your heart and mind to your own journey of connecting with the brokenness and not being afraid of it, not trying to kind of put it on the sidelines or say, well, that's a piece. I don't want to show God. I don't want to show him the warts. I don't want to show him the struggles and the challenges. I don't want to show my lust, my pride, my arrogance. And I'm speaking for myself. God wants us to be attuned to these areas because he wants to crucify them so he can be alive in us and experience the outpouring of grace. Amen, Blaine. Amen, brother. Woo. So my brother Blaine here, just a brief charting of his history. Uh, I knew him at Steubenville, Franciscan University. I'd already graduated from college. I was working for Light and Life Foundation, evangelizing around the country. And Blaine uh, was a very on-fire young disciple of Jesus there. I knew him there. And I'm going to say this with affection, off the wall, like spiritually on fire. And uh, a year or two later, uh, we met up at Mount St. Mary's in Emmitsburg. So we both had entered seminary. I was a year before him. And uh, both for the Diocese of Peoria, Illinois. He was, I, I discerned, as many of you know my story, I discerned theology of the body. It informed me profoundly of a call to uh, priest, prophet, and king as a, as a father in a home. I left seminary before being ordained and uh, was just literally a, a semester away from being ordained a deacon. Blaine was called onto that um, ordination, became a priest, as you're going to hear tonight, uh, the theme of his battle in the midst of that, left the priesthood, if you will, once ordained, always ordained. And we get that, but he will share with us some of those circumstances and the battle that ensued and brings us to the point where he is now married with three children and he's an on-fire disciple of Jesus. And what I love about my brother here, and you're going to hear this authenticity, is God's blessedness through the brokenness. 
I don't know anybody like my brother here who's so candid and vulnerable and honest about these aspects of his journey. So as he shares with us tonight, allow yourself to connect with the brokenness in your life, not as something to be excluded again, but an occasion, a door, a portal through which Christ enters that we can enter into. This is my body broken for you. So with all of that said, welcome to our program, Blaine. Thank you, brother. Well, you're live, buddy. Let's let's bring it. Let's go back to the beginning. Tell us about the Blaine Diachi household in Boston, Massachusetts. All right. So gr- growing up as a kid, you know, I was born in 71. I'll be 50 this year. And uh, it's kind of typical. You know, I was an only child for about 15 years. Hmm. And, um, you know, my parents were, were marginally Catholic. And I remember, you know, growing up, um, you know, take kind of take you past the birth years. And I I used to, uh, as a kid, dream almost nightly that I was with angels, like a legion of them above mm. the trees. And I I didn't understand what was going on. And they, my parents took me to mass, hit or miss here and there. Mm-hmm. But every time I'd go, I'd experience, you know, so personal testimony francis xavier says you know we can argue points of doctrine but you can't argue personal testimony Mm. amen because it's the affection and the love that god's showing you you know that private revelation as he's calling you into encounter and he had been calling me since i was a young little kid to be completely his and and i was experiencing that but i didn't have anyone to really guide me or to talk to me about it and Growing up, my dad was a bit of a wild man. You know, he, we didn't realize how badly we now we do to no fault of his own how much he suffered mm. from PTSD. Mm. You know, from the Vietnam War, and wow. you know there were there were points of time where you know my parents would be argumentative or um, growing up and, uh, and and just they'd be beefing here and there, and and, and I didn't quite get what was going on. I thought it was just sure. you know this, what this is like what a normal home is supposed to look like and uh and through it all ultimately um, god still had beckoned and called me i'd go to mass and i would physically feel the presence of god sometimes i'd go with my family but sometimes i wouldn't i'd go on my own Mm. and i can't remember the name of the parish but i used to always sit in the back and this old franciscan guy came up to me at the time (laughs) he was probably in his 50s and he said man he said he said, the anointing of God is on you. Have you ever thought of being a priest? Or I'm like, man, I I just know that when you hold the host in the air, something's going on. And right. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting these tinglys all throughout Mass, and I don't know what to make of them, heads or tails, you know. And, uh, you know, so, so my childhood wasn't always easy. You know, my, my dad was abusive verbally mm-hmm. sometimes, on occasionally physically mm-hmm. with my mom. But... Uh, again, my mom stuck with them um, throughout all those years, mm. you know, because then, maybe differently today, but to them, a marriage was a marriage was a marriage. And, um, you know, you, you stuck those things out. My mom, just in her suffering love for my dad towards the end of his life, kind of caught wind and in, in great understanding of what he was suffering from. Mm. Mm. And uh, it was pretty, pretty, you know, it was pretty redemptive. But my dad used to always tell me two things. Never, never quit and keep pushing. Mm. Never quit and keep pushing in any and everything that you do in your life. And so, you know, that's resonated. That's obviously carried over into my own life. But growing up wasn't always easy, Mm. you know, because he'd go out and party, be drunk. Sometimes he'd be absent. I think we moved probably 10 to 15 times. Wow. You know, from when I was a young man. So the stability factor wasn't there. Sure. My parents were there, but the stability factor wasn't, but largely due to this like crushing PTSD. Mm-hmm. I mean, the man did three tours in Vietnam, saw a lot of action. So that brokenness was kind of brought into and introduced into my life. And I remember when I was. Oh, I want to say maybe 14 or 15. Well, my dad, he, he had gotten caught for warrants and, and was put in uh, jail for like seven months. And, mm. and my mom was pregnant with my sister and I was going to church and I tipped my head back and I said, Lord, 
because my dad cannot be my father, I said, you will be my father mm. this day, moving forward. And I'll never forget that encounter, you know. Mm. And he, he always used to tell me, be, be better than me. Don't be me, son, mm. in regards to my dad. And so, you know, I, I, I took all that to heart, man. I thought, you know, growing up, um, you know, even through high school years, you know, my friends were dabbling premarital sex, going out and partying. And people were like, man, you ever see the size of Diachi's dad? Ooh, we got to get him home on time. And I, 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 <laughs> so, so for whatever strange reason, I had this like deathly fear of if I have premarital sex, I'm going to burn in hell. If I do these things, if I go out and drink or do this and that, like I, I, I just would never cross the line even – going into my years after graduation mm -hmm. going to a junior college so I, had a, I have to pause you a second i inherited three fun phrases from the arch which by the way i refer to my brother here as the arch because blaine is one of the most colorful people i know in terms of communicating the gospel and one is you talking about the ladies and blaine is an italian stallion so he's, he's a good looking dude he's not as handsome as me or as big as me i'm kidding <laughs> blaine is just a yeah. specimen and he'd speak about the ladies trying to pluck his flower usually you hear that the other way around but blaine very selective solicitous of the purity God called him to. I recall that phrase. I also, you also introduced, which my family has heard me speak of the Heisman. Those of you who know the Notre Dame image, Blaine would talk about the purity as being the football he'd hold in his arm and he'd have that hand out, you know, he'd keep the, the offending forces that were after his purity. He'd talk about that. I'd give him the Heisman and I can't imitate Blaine. Give him the Heisman. And, uh, and there's another one just very endearing as you talked about your mom. You'd call her Sister Sled. She'd be waving that hammer in the midst of your dad and deficiencies that your mom in a very natural human way had very saintly qualities your, your dad's name is john your mom's name is it is linda 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 so you call her sister sledge anyways i gotta throw that out there All right continue the greg, story blaine greg, stuck with me greg you you are absolutely right you know i i was there and all these girls they you know I, i'd be going to mass on sunday i wasn't at a a christian um junior college i went to dean junior college franklin mass and oh my gosh man just it how pathetic sin is, is people were like, oh, Diachi's a virgin? Oh, I got to hook up with him. And I was like, nah, we're not having it. Because that fear of sinning carried mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. into into my junior college years, man. And uh, not that there weren't near occasions or me, me walking in that sinless life, but I was still adamant about weekly confession mm -hmm. and, and, and attending mass. And, uh, you know, my junior college years, I, I, I loved them. I loved college, but when my that was at the time when my dad was still in prison. So he, he mm -hmm. had just gotten out. He had heard about the Franciscan University of Steubenville, mm -hmm. and he said, I want you to go here. And he mm -hmm. said, don't, don't ask any questions as to why. He said, I just want you to go here. Beautiful. So it was at my junior college that I began to really get into the rosary, and my grandmother said, you, you need to learn how to pray, and I started praying it daily. And, you know, I'd open the, the Word of God here and there and uh, still just trying to walk out my life being the best kid that I could be in the midst of circumstance. You know, my sister sure. finally came along and 15 years later and, um, you know, she was she was born. And, uh, you know, m my dad had that encounter in prison and he, he came back, you know, he's home. I ended up going to the Franciscan University of Steubenville, kind of raw. I remember sitting next to Maria Finelli's dad, Alfredo, and he's a deep, hmm. dear buddy online. At one of the first masses I attended there after, you know, uh, orientation, I think John Wallace was sitting down, Tasha Beal, hmm. and a couple other people. I'm like, hey, so where are all the chicks at, man? <laughs> and, uh, and they were like, dude, John's like, oh, Lord. <laughs> We're going to have to watch out for you, dude. And uh, and so I remember going to that mass, and I'm like, I'm not raising my hands. What are these crazy people doing, man? You know, they're playing some praise and worship music just prior to mass beginning. And Alfredo said, the Holy Spirit, he said, you're like a cherry tree right now, young man, and you don't even know it. And he said, I know you feel the presence of God. I said, I do, but this is like a completely out-of-the-box, you know, dynamic orthodoxy being professed and lived out in these young people's lives. And uh, then everybody started to press me 
and say, dude, you need to go to Life in the Spirit. You need to go to this <laughs> Life in the Spirit seminar. And at the time, I think it was, I want to say, maybe 92, 93, somewhere in that time frame. Okay. And I think Father Ed Wade was directing them with awesome. you know, some of the stu student leaders. And, you know, he, he, Father Ed was a good guy, raw priest, just kind of told it like Love Father was, Ed. You know, pretty blunt guy. And so I, I, I went, and he pulled me aside one day prior to the, the laying on of hands and asking the Holy Spirit to really just come in, in that personal encounter. I didn't know what to expect. And I remember the team I was with was Dave Vogel. Hmm. I can't yeah. remember a couple of the other guys, but Dave, Dave was kind of the, the, the leader. And Ed pulled me aside, Father Ed Wade pulled me aside, and he said, ask with the greatest of expectation that you can, ask, ask, and don't be afraid to ask. And so the night mm -hmm. came, and we were all praising and worshiping, and everybody, you know, start, some people were tearing up. And I, the Lord said, I want you to be the last one to get prayed with. And I remember I started bawling. Mm -hmm. you got to forgive me for getting emotional, because there, there was probably a great amount of healing that began to take place mm -hmm. there. But also... The, the outward move of just who I am before Christ and always have been and never really could understand because I didn't have a spiritual director. You know, we had household mm -hmm. leaders. and So I, I'm sitting there and, and Vogel comes up and he says, he says, what do you want from our Lord? And I kid you not, without hesitation, I began to cry and I said, I want to die mm -hmm. for Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I want to die for Jesus Christ. They laid hands. Holy Spirit rushed on me, and, you know, the, the rest was history. I remember t at times being in prayer in, in, in my dorm room saying, Lord, I want the life of St. Paul. Mm. I said, everybody talks about him, but they don't want his life. I said, I want his life. That's beautiful. Little did I know what I was asking right. for. I probably should have picked John the Beloved. <laughs> <laughs> But the spirit moved you, right, brother? I mean, it wasn't yeah. you. You availed to the power of the spirit, and you knew that that captured your heart, and you could do no other. So, tell me that that's not an important part of this—that you surrendered and you found yourself fully responsive to the Holy Spirit. Right, right, and and it, it, it was just a powerful, powerful encounter. And I remember people coming up to me after. You know, I joined Hearts of Fire, and then eventually my senior year joined Koinonia as I began to discern. But people at times would run up to me and say, dude, you can't be this on fire. This has got to be just sheer emotion. I said, dude, I said, I don't know what happened and what was ignited in me but this compulsion to not stop talking mm. about Christ the King and living his life. And, and just I just had this just burning desire to be dedicated to the King of Kings. Mm. And, uh, you know, and so the rest carried on. My senior year came and I was discerning my vocation. I came back home. I worked the summer. I had a had big old beard when I graduated. And my mom and dad were like, you going to shave that thing off? I said, no, nah, I'm going to go be a Franciscan. Mm. And that summer I went to go see the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal and Glenn Sedano said, man, you, you got a vocation, dude. He said, I just don't know if it's here mm -hmm. and if it's right now mm. with us. And I said, okay. And so I came back and I was, you know, getting panicky because I had switched my major, had a, a biblical studies degree. And I'm like, man, what the heck am I going to do with this thing? You know, <laughs> and, uh, and, and the Lord said, I'm calling you to be a priest. And so mm. everybody had already applied to the Diocese of Peoria. And I was the last one to get in in August. I mean, the door flew open so quickly. I remember being at St. Peter's when they brought me out to visit after they accepted my application. They wanted to meet me. And, you know, they had heard all these nutty things about me from Holloway and Hummel. Funny. And a couple other people. Let me and pause you a second. Let me pause a second, sure. Blaine. So I had spent a year with Father Benedict Grishel living at Trinity Retreat, discerning myself at this point, following a powerful experience at Medjugorje. Found myself then discerning at Mount St. Mary's in Emmitsburg, and I was with the Diocese of Peoria. So interesting, you probably knew this, but I cir circled back to some of these friends, Hummel, Vogels, and others, 
uh, who were not from that diocese, who did not live there. And there was a bit of an appeal, if you will, to Orthodox uh, Steubenville grads to be anchored in that diocese. So what, what, drew you spe- what drew you specifically to that diocese, never having lived there? Well, I, I had li- initially looked at the Archdiocese of Boston. And the vocation director at that time, I can't, I, I'm not going to say his name. He was kind of standoffish and a little bit pushed back, and Cardinal Law was there, and I kind of knew him to be like a middle of the road guy. Mm-hmm. And uh, then Holloway's like, dude, you should maybe apply here. Eric, Dave Erickson's like, mm-hmm. come on, Diaz, you need to apply here, buddy. So I ended up studying for, for the Diocese of Peoria, went to the Mount. Um, I enjoyed my years there, and, you know, it, I think at one point I I may have been like, after first theology, questioning, um, you know, my vocation a little bit. But Monsignor Rolchin at the time he was he was the the head of my favorite people ever. And yeah, and he you know just a man of prayer, always first in, last out, and he just encouraged me, said you got a vocation, you just got to roll with this thing, Hmm. and uh, and and just be formed, you know, because I, I was I was still an on fire guy, you know. But like any young, virile, robust guy, man, at that time, you know, because you got to be candid about the, the sins that you struggle with, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So it was, it was always like just lustful thoughts or just trying to work through and find that purity, mm-hmm. even though it was being maintained and lived out in frequent confession and frequent prayer and frequent formation and, and the frequency uh, of you know, that the theological formation that we had, that camaraderie of brothers, the encouragement of prayer. Um, but it wasn't until really my deacon ordination that, that I realized, wow, something actually happens where you change, mm-hmm. right? And that ontological change was to, to so be united to Christ in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, and every bit of who he was. And, you know, it carried on early into my priesthood. But again, the, the, the struggle with just that concupiscal pull, and it happens to everybody, to not staying and steering towards Jesus all the time. We, mm-hmm. love, we love self sometimes more than we love Christ Jesus. And, man, that, that's, that's the worst. And I remember doing my diligence at the parish. You know, I had first arrived at, at St. Joseph's Catholic Church uh, in Pekin, Illinois, and two days later, the pastor took off for three weeks. Well, mm. the things they don't teach you in the seminary is to ask for help or to call other guys for help, man. Mm. I was working 90 hours a week saying mm. all the masses, trying to be available to the people and still learning. I think it was the first time I ever had an anxiety attack when he threw like 60 keys on a ring on my desk and my head started to spin and I was wow. like, what? I'm like, what, what's going on wow. here? And he said, oh, I'm going on vacation. Took off, went on vacation. So wow. here's a young priest, you know, praying his tail off, being left there, um, trying, to, j- trying to just be faithful. Mm. And, and, and long story short, you know, I was ordained in 99, and I want to say maybe a year and a half or t- just two years in in 2001. You know, the world, the flesh, and the devil struck. And this will lead up even to stuff that God has been showing me now about my vocation. Hmm. And the craziest part of all of it was, this side of heaven will never see. Maybe Satan caught sight of what I was going to become as a presbyter in ministry. Because, man, I was so on fire, but I was so untempered in wisdom, wisdom and knowledge. I didn't know how to take all of the suffering that was occurring. Mm. I remember having a meeting with some of the leaders of the diocese and trying to explain to them, this is what is going on in my soul. Mm. And one of them, a leading Monsignor at the time, chimed up and he said, he said, Father Diachi, he said, this stuff doesn't happen until you're 30 years a priest. Well, I said, man, I just mentioned it to you. So it's happening now. Mm. And, and I don't know what to do or how to. And so I, I would go and pray and I'd flee in prayer. And, you know, hoping, just trying to cling Mm. because I cherished my celibacy, you know, Uh, you know, I was a celibate Marine for the son of the living God. I was his warrior, his war fighter for souls trying to win them over, not just because of youthful exuberance, but because of the gift of zeal Mm. that he had placed in me. And man, 
I, it was like I was sitting on a pedestal mm. of the devil. My flesh and the world said, lift your head just a little bit higher. Mm. Blaine, let me pause you for a second. Do you have your train of thought? Yeah. Good, absolutely. good. So I think that one way the enemy works, we read screw tape letters. I encourage any of you, our listeners, if you want great insight into a way the enemy whispers lies to us. And I mean, those of us who are spiritually oriented, a big one, and I think you're invoking this, is a kind of spiritual narcissism there's other kinds of narcissism right where it may just be vanity or other things but there's a kind of spiritual narcissism where we derive our value from the holy things we think we're doing and it can create a cloud of distance from god and certainly were these not the kind of very things that the christ was most uh angry about or indignant were those who, of the religious class but i want to point out specifically and just your thoughts in this particular time of your life that three of the brothers whom you mentioned who I hold very close to me also, who are at the Mount, who are seminarians uh, from Steubenville, who are on fire, who are vibrant, who are, uh, just gave profound witness to Christ. Three of them that you mentioned in the context of this story so far have left the priesthood. So there was something... There was something, you know, going on bigger than just Blaine. There, there was a culture of something going on here. Can you, do you ever reflect back on what, what kind of toxicity was happening in an atmosphere, shall we say, of dynamic orthodoxy? What, did, what was the blind spot that was being missed? The understanding of how important suffering is. Mm. Mm. Because suffering is what matures you. Suffering is what puts miles on you. Suffering is that which gives depth to your soul. And if you don't have a good, whether it's a personal theology or a great understanding of soteriology in one's life, then you will never arrive at resurrection. Hmm. Because you will talk about the cross, but you will never embrace it. Hmm. It's epic. You will talk about the wounded hands of Christ, but you will not put yours down that nails will be driven through. You will talk about the wounded heart of Christ, but you won't let your own be pierced. You will talk about mm. the wounded feet, but you won't walk exactly where he walked. You'll talk about, as Bernard of Clairvaux so boldly points out, the shoulder wound of Christ, but you will not, if you will, move synergistically with Christ, mm. never out of sync with him. Mm. Mm. And when you move out of sync, with him and with the Holy Spirit. That's when the world, the flesh, and the devil will strike. Whether Satan catches sight of what you will become or what you won't because he's a fallen angel or it's just your own flesh and, and the failure because you can make your holy hours until the cows come home and that's well and good. But if you're not personally deeply encountering Jesus, if you're just asking for holiness and resurrection and not asking and pleading for the cross of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. there will be no depth to you. And I even make reference to those who are pure, who have never fallen. If they do not embrace their cross, the depth of it and desire death so that they can really live, then you're going to fall. Then, then you will become what I became, an example to many, not what to become. Mm. And, That's and amazing. Selfish, and selfishness, the, the, the rest was history, you know. Got, got, I, I remember saying Mass with mortal sin over me mm. or, and, and, and holding the King of Glory in my hands. Mm. And, and the reminder that He still shows up despite my faithlessness at mm. that particular point in time. Mm. And, you know, and then in 90, you know, and then in 2001, I contracted marriage to, to my two older kids, Blaine and Emily. Emily, who, whom I adopted, and Blaine, we had, you know, got married quickly in a Methodist church. We invited sin into our marriage, and, and the thing just imploded, man. You know, I was banging on the gates of hell. Let me pause out. you a second. Let me pause sure. you a second. I'm so moved mm -hmm. by you, and mm -hmm. I have tears in my eyes thinking uh, about how the kingdom of hell uh, is uh, assailed by your honesty, assailed by calling upon our awareness of unity with Christ in suffering and in sacrifice, and how that was a, a singular reason for really good godly brothers who were priests to fall by not understanding it, embracing it, walking in it, and then, of course, sh you know, sharing your own experience with that. If you don't mind, 
Blaine, share, if you will, it must have been anguishing to decide to leave. So I intuit here that you had already fallen. And uh, so you'd already made that leap and you kind of saw, I'm sure, the frog in the cold water being heated up slowly. I mean, how was the tug of, tug of war going on in your soul? So after, you know, all this came to head, I, I had the, the bishop said, I want you to go to retreat with Groeschel or I'll send you home for 10 days or something like that. So he ended up, yeah, I, I said, oh, I'm going to go home, thinking oh, I'd be more comfort at home. I should have went to retreat with Groeschel. Because God, who knows? I, maybe I'd still be in. Maybe I'd be a nutty bishop that's just <laughs> preaching the truth, you know? No, I'm being, I'm being right. plain Jane honest, brother, yep. you know? I, I, am, I am so battle-tested in this thing, and that's not an attaboy. Mm. It is because I had to suffer a great deal. Mm. And suffering sometimes when you don't know how to embrace it, it is the first thing that will disarm Satan when you embrace it and it becomes your joy mm -hmm. but when it doesn't and it the cross just remains the cross that element of torture instead of sanctification right mm -hmm. then satan's gonna have a heyday and so i went home and i was like ah and then i you know and the rest was history i just gave into the flesh because all it, it, it this feeling but the truth transcends your feelings but at that time I didn't know how to let the truth transcend my physical feeling, right? Mm -hmm. That's an important it's, point. It, it, it's, an, it's incredibly important because this is today's society that we live in. Mm -hmm. That's the whole transgender issue. Mm -hmm. I feel it's Descartian, man. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. People need to get past one thing and one thing really and deeply in their own individual encounter with Christ Jesus, and it's this. The truth will always convict you. It will never condemn you. Hmm. But because you feel like it condemns you, then you have not truly let the truth transcend you. Hmm. And until you let that occur, you're going to continue to walk in that regard. And then you won't pray the big, bold prayers that you ask, that you believe that you can ask, that you are been tasked to ask hmm. before Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and, you know, what ended up happening was, you know, as I said, we got married and then we invited sin into our marriage and then the rest was history, man. Then I end up, uh, I think, you know, maybe a year after that, Blaine and Emily were little, you know, maybe three and one. I became kind of a lousy dad to them for some mm. time, just had roommates going job to job, partying, slept with like 20 or 30 women in one year. Mm. And then I remember kneeling down by my mm. bedside. And I said, I don't want to be afraid anymore. Then, you know, Tasha and I met. We, we had Isaiah outside of be, being married. You know, she was pregnant. And, you know, it, and, then, and then God just gradually began to do this mighty work mm. of reaching back into me. At first, it was running around with assemblies of God and evangelicals. And, you know, at, at this time, hadn't been to confession yet or anything. But yet, because the Holy Spirit will never deny the faithfulness of the Father and the Son. Hmm. He was showing up doing mighty works with all these evangelicals using me, and I, I, I still didn't get it. Hmm. I still didn't get it. I'm like, why are you using me? I'm sitting here stooped in sin. And then, you know, hmm. I started making my way back to church, and the sen I had it because I had a censure put on me. Hmm. And people, you don't want a censure put on you. Right. You don't want to be excommunicated. You don't want any... I, I tasted that pain, man. Can I pause you? What, what, for our listeners' sake, so you you left active priesthood. Once a priest, always a priest. Formally, what does that look like? What does it require? What does it mean? Basically, you know, I was under censure because I invalidly had con contracted marriage. I was still a clergyman, hadn't been laicized mm. to this point yet. You know, my laicization didn't come through until... May 15th of maybe 2015. Wow. So I was, still, I was still outside of the church, and we were still living in Illinois at that time. Yeah, man, it was just a mess. And, mm. you, you know, to be away from, and I held him in my hands, man. Mm. Were you, you in know? denial? Like, were you in denial of the implications of the moral life of the truth of it, or were you just in rebellion against it? Like, denial or rebellion? It, a little of both. A little of both. You know, a little of both because you still wake up, go to bed, go to sleep, wake up, go to bed, sleep, do, you know, and you're still trying to make a change, but you don't understand 
how important the truth is, how freeing the truth is. So you can deny it, right? And you can rebel against it. But the more you do that, the more turmoil that you cause within oneself. Do you reflect upon some fundamental pillars in your core that were just not strong and 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 collapsed, if you will, that, you know, your, your relationship with your dad, for instance? I mean, what are some of the I know you take ownership for your decisions, but what what was missing in the foundation that was causing this to happen? I, I, I think ultimately when you are not fathered mm. and, and disciplined and loving discipline, right? Like Hebrew says, if you're not disciplined and fathered, then it's not that you will necessarily go and do whatever you want, but the lack of formation that takes place beyond just your flesh and blood and your intellect, but deep in your soul, mm. will it will affect you. Mm. And, and a lot of people don't understand that because they'll you know Catholics are great at knowing intellectually that you have the truth but if the way the truth and the life does not spiritually grab the entirety of the person in your flesh and your bone and your thoughts your attitudes your reaction to situation and circumstance so all I knew when growing up was seeing what we didn't understand at that time to be PTSD and a lack of discipline and a lack of presently being there because he was absent a lot, right? Mm -hmm. and, but the father is never absent. That's the thing. That's the thing that's to be learned from a, a great majority of this walk is God the father is never absent. And when my dad needed a father at the end, the roles were reversed. Hmm. And it, it, was, it was pretty touching and I think his, his, his prophetic death was prophetic not only for himself but for me because I thought to myself man if you show up this big for him man I hope <laughs> but then I started thinking man I've, been, I've done a whole terrible amount of things Lord hmm. I hope you show up half this way for me brother hmm. I hope you show up half this way for me because today a lot of people you know, we're, nobody's perfect. We're working our way there. But if our zeal isn't igniting our faith in love, if there are a lack of those things, right? Because it can become a drudgery. But when the compulsion, that compelling power, as Paul would say, that moved him, when it comes from heaven itself, man, everything that tries to chain you back will keep you compounded and chained to the world the flesh and the devil will be broken so quickly mm -hmm. and vehemently because more and more your conscience is formed more and more your soul is formed more and more your faith your hope your love your life becomes formed in Christ Jesus mm -hmm. and the only thing that you'll find yourself uttering this side of heaven is even if you move in the power of resurrection and the power of the Holy Spirit is give me the cross. Mm -hmm. May it triumph in my life and in my words, maybe not your own, but it would echo and come out similar. Kill all of the rebellion in me and make sure that none of it lives. Mm -hmm. Make sure that none of it lives. Blaine, it also sounds um, as you share your story that you were missing out on spiritual fatherhood with priests who would have been above you or around you. Um, do you want to speak to that at all? Yeah, I mean, you know, having uh, spiritual director is great, man. I had Don Haggerty in the seminary, but I would explain to him some of the things that I would see and hear and know and do, and he was a holy man. He was mm -hmm. a man of great prayer, and he, he encouraged me practically to just begin to engage in prayer. Because I, you know, I told him, look, man, I speak in tongues. I can interpret. I see stuff, which is hilarious because I'm not an intellectual and God comes to my intellect. And <laughs> that's, that's where I catch vision. You know, there are people who are genius and I'm not a genius. I, I'm not a very uh, genius-y guy. I'm educated. Genius -y. There's, You know, there's a distinct <laughs> difference there, man. I mean, they call a you. spade a spade. And, 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 never really understanding all those things um 
you know, in, in trying to divulge them and explain them because I, I didn't realize how much God loved me and how much he was giving me, you mm -hmm. know. And, and, and I think the important part, you know, as we're getting closer and closer to winding down here, the parts that you need to hear now, in this testimony and that Please. other people do and I pray that it touches people I pray mm. that it touches my brother priests to become such men of prayer mm. and not men of a gosh dang you know address book or you know calendar where they're trying to fill up thing after thing mm. be men of prayer and do not leave that place mm. be men of prayer and do not leave that place be men of great repentance and great humility, and do not leave that place lest you look like me. And I am an example to you as to how not to look. And to the laity, I say, I am an example of how to strive in the will of God, in his freedom, in trust, in the pain and the suffering, mm -hmm. of how to try to make the attempts, even if you have to carry your family, family to the cross and then lay them there and leave them there whether they listen to your example to your holy words but trust me trust me trust me my prayers will win you at some point in the end of all of this mm. because i am going to bring you to the son of god whether you like it or not and it, those things are so important it's not just about the passion and the zeal that exists there you know I, i've been weeping a lot this whole lent for me this past Lent I said cleanse my conscience mm -hmm. man if the devil wasn't trying to bring up stuff from 30 years as as I'm coming into my waking moments I said dude you're so pathetic mm -hmm. I said you're bigger stronger faster and smarter than me dot 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 but I have the Father the Son the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. I pray for my will now to be fused mm -hmm. to be fused stronger than any weld to the Immaculata's will to her heart mm -hmm. So that I can be the complete possession of God the Father's Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Mm, thank you, Lord. I, I pray crazy prayers. I pray to be apostolic, flowing like living water, prophetic and speaking the heart and mind of Christ, evangelical, tearing down demonic strongholds, whether I see them in ministry face to face or just know it to be happening in spirit and truth. I pray to be the war priest, mm. even though it looks different. Mm. That brings peace. And I pray to be the husband and the dad that I need to be. Mm. So Not moved. Want to be, Folks, you're tuning to Ignite Radio Live. So blessed that you are with us in this Easter season with my brother, Blaine Diachi, sharing with us so candidly, beautifully, powerfully, authentically, in a mm. raw way. Just, I, I would say, the cord of human existence. Mm. A human existence that is made for God, made to know God, will experience languishing. Until we, until we choose him. And uh, all of us along that way, right, kind of, sort of, maybe this point, maybe that retreat, maybe that season of grace. He, he is a priest. He was ordained a priest. He had a journey as a background, broken background, uh, came to encounter Christ in a powerful way in the Holy Spirit at Steubenville, entered the priesthood, became a priest, ordained, found himself into a way of sin. He talks about that in this beautiful sharing his story here on the other end. The battle continued, you know, with the enemy all along. And now coming into this place right now, talking about this recent Lent, literally weeping tears of, of awareness, of, re of repentance, but flowing from what? God's profound love for us, his desire, his unending, unrelenting desire for us to be in intimacy with him until which we will not be fulfilled, until which we will be experienced languishing and alienation. He's speaking to priests, brother priests out there, and, and inviting them, encouraging them, challenging them to recognize just this emaciated world around us need to know their fatherly presence, need to know the the heart of the Father, through them above every other thing, above calendars, as he talks about, above programs, lay people to recognize the cross, recognize the suffering, and Christ is in it. Hey, Blaine, somebody right now just turned over from uh, Van Halen, and then before that was Led Zeppelin. They landed on the station, and they haven't been to church, if ever, and they are just deeply negative and angry towards uh, hypocrisy, self-righteousness, all of that that the church has represented to them, pedophilia, the whole thing and they're going at they're not happy with a lot of the decisions they're making but the church sure as hell doesn't offer them if you will a portrait of anything that is meaningful they're pining for truth speak to them right now oh man jesus is waiting and you have no idea how loved you are and he understands your hurt and your brokenness he understands more than we will ever ever understand ourselves 
beyond just the seeing, the frailty, the frailty that exists right now in the church. Because she would seem almost at times faithless. Mm -hmm. But God has given you that spark of faith, that spark of hope, that spark of love to turn to him. He is always waiting. His divine mercy is so beautiful and so powerful, and it is in that place that I abide. And I tell you to be like the Syrophoenician woman that is under the table, and even the scraps that would fall to you to consume them. Let no grace escape you, no love escape you. Jesus understands your hurts, your anxiety, and your anguish, and your lament more than you will ever know. And he is always there, and he's standing at the door knocking. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is open it. All you have to do is open it. And Jesus will show you how to love those who are hurting the church right now. He will show you how to love our Protestant brothers and sisters, the Catholics who are not Catholics, the Orthodox and the enemies of the church. He will show you how to love them. Mm -hmm. He will show you how to love them. And it all starts with, Lord, come in. Lord, come in. I give you permission to come in. Mm. And because grace is so powerful, it could be immediate healing. There could be, because that's how Christ works. There could be, over these years and days, suffering and the coming out of oneself and more into Christ. As you, you know, to move in synergy with Him, to never move out of sync with Him. And if you find yourself doing so, to not be afraid to confess your sins. I can't stress enough in this time in the world right now, the, the need for the body, the blood, the soul, and the divinity of Jesus Christ, and to go to reconciliation beyond, mm. beyond just what the church is asking you. Some will say once a week is great. Brother, I go two to three times a week for the sanctification and the salvation of my soul because I burn for men and I pity when they are not coming to Christ. I find myself grieving, yet always joyous that I would win souls, win the Protestants back home, mm -hmm. John 17, John 6, to win the Catholics who aren't Catholic, to win the Orthodox, to win the enemies of the church. When heresy is spoken, to call it heresy and not ambiguous talk, to live and stay in prayer. I got to share a few things with you, man. Please. Because there were kicks in the teeth to me when I was in prayer. And we can maybe start wrapping it up at that point. But one day I was in prayer and the Lord said, Blaine, how's your prayer life? I said, great, Lord. It's, you know... On a, on a bad day, it's two hours a day. Some days, it's up to five hours a day. And mm -hmm. the Lord said, Blaine, I didn't call you to have a good prayer life or a great prayer life or an excellent one, nor a stupendous one. I called you to have a perpetual prayer life. Mm -hmm. And I was like, gosh, dang, why does everything revolve around humility? And it was <laughs> Paul's reminder, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, never cease praying, mm -hmm. never cease praying praying. You want to encounter? You want to win your church back? You want to win the world for Christ? You want to be an apostle? You want to win a nation? It begins in prayer. And then it is followed by deep, loving repentance. The sanctification of one soul, knowing that this just desperate need, as I preached yesterday, this desperate need for holiness and sanctification and to be on fire and to be a saint, to die a martyr. And if I can't die a martyr, then to be a confessor for the faith. Mm -hmm. Even if I am fearful in that moment, love will cast out all that fear. I know I have had many Simon of Cyrene's helping me get to Calvary, get to where Jesus wants me so that I am no longer breathing, but it's him who's breathing in me. Mm. And yesterday after Mass, before I went to confession, I saw again the meshing of two men. But this time, he was in front of a full congregation. And on one side was all clergy. And on the other side were all laity. And I said, who is that? And he said, it's you. And as I continued to pray, out of my mouth came a river. He said, you must witness to my church, my life, and never forego it, never stop boldly doing it, never stop praying for it. If they will not listen to your words, then may they follow your example, and if they will not listen to your example, win them in your prayer. Hmm. 
And I was Beautiful. so humbled, I started to cry. And then I, I was like, hey, man, I need to go to confession. <laughs> <laughs> and I was wow. just overwhelmed because mm. I don't always know how to make heads or tails. And here lately, the Lord's put on my heart, you know what your laicization says, you can't teach, you can't do this, you can't do that, trying to handcuff you. He said, maybe someone will have the courage to invite you to become what you have been called to be for a long time, mm -hmm. and that is a parish missionary, preaching not only to the priests, but to the laity to ignite and catch fire, to pray and repent. Because I long thought my greatest gift was to preach, mm -hmm. but the Lord said, you're a knucklehead for thinking that. Mm -hmm. He said, I have given you the gift of faith, mm -hmm. and now it moves with love. Mm -hmm. Now it knows suffering. Now I have put wisdom in it, maturity. I'm like, golly, why is everything so hard? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Blaine, I love you, brother, and I love your sharing just so mm -hmm. candidly. And for those of us who are listening, folks, you're getting a, a portal into the, some of the inner sanctum of my brother Blaine here, soul, in terms of um, the way the Holy Spirit is speaking to him and giving him images and insights. And uh, each of us differently, the Holy Spirit speaks. But how many of us anticipate that God is wants to be a clear God? He wants to make things clear to us. Yes, through Scripture, through the church as a foundation, right? But even in that personal sort of way in the inner sanctuary of our lives he gives us images and visions and insights in different ways and we should be receptive to that we're going to land the plane this time and I, and I do look forward to getting back with you Blaine and uh, just prayerfully journeying with you in this this vision this call of building the kingdom but I want to just um, land with one focal point you indicated that through your journey concupiscence was one of the critical challenges and I just want to proclaim this for all who are listening. And John Paul II, Carl Wojtyla said this in so many words. The heart of the sexual urge is an urge to a completion that can only be found in God. I'll say that again. That this deep desire that every human person has, Genesis 127, in his image he made the male and female, right? Male and female, sexual, as a union, as a composite, meant to image God, the Trinity. Man and woman are God's selfie, and he wired us to desire uh, a fulfillment physically as well as emotionally, relationally, spiritually, and all of that. So the heart of this, the heart of this desire is an urge to a completion that can only be found in God. And then I want to go to this point and ask your insights here. You shared with us uh, in the story uh, in this program that you had been with dozens of women uh, in a way that that you needed um, transformation of heart and mind. Now from this place, for those men who've been through pornography, which we know is 90% plus, Women, an increasingly increasing number. We know it. We have Romans 12, 1 and 2. Make yourself a living sacrifice, spiritual act of worship. Conform no longer to the ways of this world. Be transformed. There's hope in our imaginations, our minds, our desires being transformed. You're exhibiting clear signs of transformation from a life of being in a captivity uh, to a false sense of that urge, that urge with the magnets pulling on it in a different way. Speak a word of truth to those who may feel, uh, I've been too far, I've done too much, I'm haunted now even though I'm not acting on it by these images in my imaginary world. Speak to them a word of hope and encouragement that they can be transformed in Jesus Christ. That which you cling to is that which you become. Hmm. And you're not that good to blow up God's plans. Mm -hmm. He is so much more powerful than Satan. He is so much more powerful than the flesh and the allure of it. And he is so much more powerful than the world. It is for that very reason, he said, take courage. Mm -hmm. Take courage. I have overcome the world. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Folks, so blessed that you're with us tonight on Night Radio Live, seeking the heart of the Father uh, to understand it and know it intimately and personally and to live it fully, not just kind of sort of as it, we read in Revelations 3.14, be ye therefore hot or cold. Just Brother Blaine, I'm just very moved by you, Mo moved by our friendship, moved by our partnership in Christ to uh, claim the kingdom in a growing if you will, from uh, glory to glory. And all of those of you who are listening, the mere fact that you're listening means God has a appointing and anointing on your life. You're listening for a purpose. You're listening for a reason. God wants to elevate your awareness of his presence, of his profound love in your life. Receive it on this night. Blaine, I'm just going to ask you to land us with a prayer and we will conclude Amen. with that. Love you, brother. God bless. Amen. So, Father God, 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Father God, we come before you, and I just ask that you will bless Greg and his family, all the listeners, but the entire world, our brothers and sisters who are Protestant, the Catholics, the Orthodox, and even the enemies of the Church, that they would all come to the abiding presence of the beauty of the Sacred Heart of mm. Jesus Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, ignite in us. Mm. May we burn, may you consume all that is not holy in us and sanctify us. May the very wind and breath of God blow over us and in us to share the mighty message of Jesus Christ. Mm. And may we flow like living water from before the throne of the Father and the Lamb in Revelation 22.1. May we be it, Lord. And may we take your hand, Immaculata, and be led to your Son and fused to you. May we know that we have such a heavenly host and the kingdom and the power and the glory of the angels and saints looking down upon us, watching over us. Lord, may we terrorize now in reverse the world, the flesh, and the devil as they have long terrorized us and tried to steal us from salvation. May we cling to the cross of Jesus Christ to know the power of resurrection and Holy Spirit, keep us lovingly so small that Jesus would be the greatest thing in us, over us, through us, emanating out of us, mm -hmm. that we would never seek or look for anything else but Christ thy King. Father God, may we move in the freedom of thy will. May you give us, Jesus, the gift of your intimacy with the Father and the Holy Spirit and the great Blessed Lady. Mm -hmm. May we move in it and live from that place, whatever our call is. However big, grand, or small, Lord, you have called us all, and you know our names. Jesus, we thank you for your death on the tree. We thank you for your resurrection, and we thank you for your glory and the chance someday to see the face of mm. the Father and live because of you. Mm. Amen. 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 Folks, you're tuning into Ignite Real Life. Thank you so much for being along the journey with us. If you want to see the Word made flesh and live it out more fully and be encouraged in your marriage and family to a level maybe you've never experienced before, if your heart yearns for that, find out more at ilovemyfamily.us. ilovemyfamily.us. We invite you to join us in this amazing journey. Until next time, God bless you. my soul